From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And in today's lineup, K-State's Beth Yeager discussing her new study of the persistence of farm financial performance. She looked at the stability of individual farm income in Kansas over a five-year span and the factors that allowed farms to consistently remain profitable over that time. Then K-State's Stephen Welch will talk about a project which will develop a new computer model for wheat that will combine crop physiology and genetics to predict how different wheat varieties will perform in different environments. And K-State's Charlie Lee talks this week about livestock guardian dogs and a new report that looks at some of the problems associated with their use. All that straight ahead on this Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and first up for you on this Tuesday, an overview of work that's just out of the Agricultural Economics Department at K-State, conducted by our guest in collaboration with a colleague out of Purdue University, and they dug into some good, solid numbers on the persistence of financial performance based on Kansas farm data. Joining us now is agricultural economist at K-State, Beth Yeager. Beth, this is now out there for folks to take a look at. Before we go any further about to what you've done here, what is meant by persistence of financial performance? All right, Eric. So what we wanted to know in terms of persistence of financial performance was looking at a number of years or periods and a farmer producer's ability to continue to produce at either a higher level or perform at a higher level over time and the number of years that they could maintain that higher level. We also, though, when we look at persistence, in some instances, we were looking at those operators who were continuing to perform at a lower level. And so the measure that we looked at for financial performance was the operating profit margin ratio. That's really an efficiency type measure. And so it looks at the producer's efficiency over time, and we're taking into consideration their net farm income, And then we adjust that for their interest expense. So we add the interest expense back into net farm income. We subtract out their unpaid family and operator labor, which we know is critical for a lot of our KFMA members. And then we divide that result by the value of farm production. And so we took that number and then divided all of our farms into quartiles. So we were looking at over a five-year period. And we had about 643 farms that we had continuous data for that five-year period. And then once we separated them out in terms of quartiles, we wanted to know the farms that were consistently performing in that top quartile. So they had their operating profit margin ratio ended up in the top quarter each individual year we examined. And then we also looked at the bottom quartile. So the producers who had an operating profit margin ratio that was following in the bottom quarter each year. And so when we talk about persistence, we're wanting to know, all right, for more than one year, how often were they in either the top quartile or the bottom quartile? This is an involved analysis, but it needs to be because when you're looking at this persistence, it has to account for a whole slew of variables. Exactly. And it was really interesting as we were looking at it, only about 2% of the farms were in that top profit margin quartile for all five years. But then as we looked at three, four or five years, there were about 17.5% of the farms that fell in that top quartile. So overall, you know, I think that's a good sign that almost 20% of our farms were in that top profit margin quartile for at least three years. And it is also higher than the number that were in the bottom profit margin quartile for three or more years. So only about 16% of the farms were consistently having the lower operating profit margin ratios. And the remainder then would fluctuate up and down, if you will, along that scale? Exactly. So the remainder then would have been in either the top profit margin quartile one or two of the years or in the bottom for one or two of the years. I think it's also really important 
as we consider these numbers and the fact that, you know, less than 20 percent were consistently in that top profit margin quartile, that over a third of our farms never reached the bottom quartile. And so I think that's something really critical to think about, that even if they struggled and maybe only were in the top quartile one or two years, they might have been in that middle range as well. Um, So that 50% that we're not necessarily looking at right now. And and so keeping them out of that bottom profit margin quartile is really critical. Were you able, Beth, through this analysis to identify the difference makers, that is the managerial approaches or styles that allowed a farm to rest somewhat consistently in that top income bracket as opposed to those that struggled to get there? We did look at different characteristics, and that's something that's kind of an ongoing project to continue to examine what kind of managerial styles were impacting those farms. Um, The ones that did consistently fall into that top profit margin quartile had higher value farm production. Typically, they were a lot larger. So on average, they had about $245,000 more value farm production than the entire sample. So they were certainly a lot larger. We didn't break them out in terms of which area of the state they were in or their enterprises. So that's something that we can certainly look at and will look at in the future. But for these initial results, we don't have yet. Cost management or expense management is a huge part of that, though, right? Exactly. So as we look at kind of what goes into this operating profit margin ratio, and, and we think about what's impacting the variables, certainly being a lower cost producer, we found has had a huge impact. So being a lower cost producer, the value of your output. So the price that you're receiving plays a big factor. And then just your efficiency overall. So your production practices, how well you're converting your inputs to outputs is really important. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, Beth, there were those operations which didn't fare so well over those five years and were leaning toward the lower end of the income stream when you uh, compare the operations in this study. So what was at the root of those struggles for those operations? So we did see about 2% of farms that ended up being identified as financially stressed throughout this five-year period. To categorize them as financially stressed, we came up with an adjusted total expense ratio that was above one, as well as a debt-to-asset ratio above 70%. And so if their adjusted total expense ratio was greater than one, basically what that's saying is they weren't able to cover their accrual expenses for their production. They also weren't able to cover their depreciation or their unpaid family and operator labor. So they might have been covering part of that, but not all of it. And so that's one thing um, to keep in mind, especially as we have many family farms that are part of our data set to make sure that they are covering some of those expenses, such as unpaid family and operator labor is definitely critical, but also the depreciation piece and making sure that debt is being managed, that it's not excessive. Um, So that debt to asset ratio above 70 percent was the number that we used. And I do want to stress the fact that less than 2 percent of the farms in our sample we're categorized as financially stressed, but certainly for those that, for that 2%, it can be really detrimental to their business. They fell within our bottom quartile for profit margin, and it's something that they're going to want to continue to watch. Probably the easiest thing to look at for them would be trying to figure out how can they reduce that debt to asset ratio. So that would likely be the first step. And then trying to cut back on some of their other expenses. So likely if they're not covering depreciation, That's probably because they have a a lot of debt caught up right now in machinery. And so figuring out a way um, to either refinance or maybe sell some of that unused machinery. Again, though, one of the conclusions you draw here, it's really difficult for a single operation to consistently stay at the top because there's a lot going on here, variables that are or aren't in the control of the producer. Exactly. So whether um, things occurring in our macro economy, the prices that we're paying for inputs, our output prices are all impacting it. So it is very difficult to stay in that top profit margin quartile. Um, We have another study that came out about the same time that where we looked at 10 years of data. And in that, we really came up with the recommendation of using kind of 20% for the operating profit margin ratio that you're looking for. Um, Really anything less than that can put you at some financial stress. And so trying to aim for that 20%. And it's critical to to use these numbers to benchmark 
your own production data and your own operation. So look at these numbers over time. There's going to be years that are a lot more difficult than others. And so kind of looking at your data, but also looking at those surrounding you. So with the KFMA data, there's resources available on agmanager.info where you can look at similar enterprises as well as similar farm sizes. Um, You can look at the state as a whole and you can look at the different regions within the state. And so making some comparisons for your own operation and kind of seeing where you fall each year is important as well. We really can't overstate the value of that Kansas Farm Management Association database for benchmarking. It's just a tremendous tool for this purpose. But again, even if an operation can't remain at the pinnacle year after year after year, one can have, as you stated in the the write-up, a sustained comparative advantage through management. Exactly. So certain management practices, again, seems like every time we survey producers and we ask what their advantage is, they say being a low-cost producer, when we look at the data, they don't always fall in that category, even though they think that's their advantage. But finding something that they do do really well, keeping accurate records, budgeting, those are all critical. And there's going to be tough years and tough times, but really trying to figure out what your niche is and having that sustained advantage, and and certainly that plays a big role. And those approaches were never more important than they are right now, given the economic state of affairs in production agriculture right now. This paper is available for review on the Ag Manager site, correct? Correct. So please go to agmanager.info. This paper's out along with some other great stuff from our department right now. And you can also link to the KFMA data from that very website as well. It's an interesting perspective on what makes farms succeed, economically speaking, in terms of the persistence of their financial success. And thanks for the quick review right here, Beth. Thank you, Eric. She's an agricultural economist at K-State, Beth Yeager, teaming up with Purdue University's Michael Langemeyer to analyze this data from 643 farms, members of the Kansas Farm Management Association, covering the calendar years 2013 to 2017 and detecting trends in that persistence of financial performance on those farms. You're listening to Agriculture Today. We'll be back with more on the K-State Radio Network. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. Glad to have you back. Boosting crop yields to feed a growing world population expected to double by the year 2050 is the aim of newly funded and multidisciplinary research led by Kansas State University. The partnership of K-State, Oklahoma State University, and Langston University has been awarded a four-year, $4 million grant from the National Science Foundation. The goal is to develop ways to improve crop yields, crop breeding programs, and infield management. The researchers involved will lead a team that will draw on expertise from many disciplines. This project by title, Building Field-Based Ecophysiological Genome-to-Phenome Prediction, a rather involved title, it will use wheat as an example crop, This team will be building a new computer model for wheat that combines crop physiology and genetics plus state-of-the-art field monitoring technologies. Instead of making assumptions on such things as soil profile data, canopy temperatures, development phases of the plant, and so on, this model will use actual measurements enabled by the new technology to predict how different wheat varieties will perform in different environments. These researchers will be building this new model and the supporting data system from scratch. The leader for K-State's part here is a professor of agronomy at the university, Stephen Welch. He visited recently with the K-State Radio Network's Richard Baker about this new undertaking. What it's about is is that as, as we look down the road to 2050 and further out, we're in a situation where 
and this is you know widely forecast the the population that we have to feed we have to have about double the annual production of grains that we do right now and if you push the pencil to that you find out that that means that for grains like rice and wheat and and corn and others uh, we need to be increasing our yields about two percent per year to hit that target and to meet that need and we are not anywhere near that we are at one half to one quarter of that rate depending upon which grains you're talking about and so that means we've got to do a couple of things number one we've got to increase the rate in crop improvement programs and as new varieties come out we need to up the rate at which you know they're getting better the other thing that we have to do is is that uh, we've got to take uh, advantage of technologies like precision agriculture and so forth so that when a new variety gets into a farmer's field it can be managed in the most effective way to to help also raise that that output level and there's a a lot of different tactics that people are looking at different parts of the puzzle and so forth how to how to do that one of the key elements is, and this sort of seems like it's delving into some nitty-gritty, but it really is central, we have to be able to predict that if a, if a particular variety has a certain genetic constitution, which the jargon word for that is genotype, we need to be able to predict quantitatively how that's going to behave in a field with a particular environment under a particular management scheme and and so forth. And the reason we have to do that is two reasons, actually. Number one, so that as that breeder is figuring out which crosses he or she wants to make to, you know, increase that rate of gain, he or she can do that in the most productive fashion to know that these lines over here probably aren't going to meet our needs and make the choices to focus on the ones with potential. And then secondly, like I said, when that when a released variety gets into the farmer's field, that genetics is going to interact with the particularities of, of that person's farm, and we want to be able to have that farmer able to manage that most effectively. And so what this project is about is bringing together a set of technologies to help do that prediction task better than it's been done up until this point. How do you go about this modeling that you're talking about? How do you go about increasing crop production as much as you say we need to do? Okay. There have been crop models that predict plant behavior dating back to the mid-60s. They focused on the physiology of the crop. How fast will a crop develop uh, if the temperature is in such and such a range and water uptake is such and such and, and so forth. It's only in the last, oh, I'll say 15 to 20 years where the science of genetics and particularly molecular genetics has been to the point where we can bring in the other half of that plant control structure, which is the genetics. And so what people have been working on since about 2000 is how to bring those two together. Now, here's the thing. If we can figure out how to do that, then crop genetics are going to improve. We certainly hope that's a premise. If we understand how the genes work and how they interact with and control that physiology and develop that plant, then we can ask questions like, if these genes were different, if we pulled a gene out of our bank of alternative varieties here and bred that in, how would that modify that control system to generate improvement? And so I guess the sort of the short answer to your question is, is that if we can make that link between the genetics and the behavior of the crop, that link is going to get us a long way down the road for a, quite a few years. How long is the grant good for before you have to go back and say we need more money to continue this? Well, okay, so when, when you get the, the letter, the, the formal letter that says you've got this thing, okay, it says in there that it is, it is expected that this funding will last for four years. 
usually money is allocated, you actually get the money year by year by year depending upon your reports. Now, NSF, National Science Foundation, I'm not quite sure why they did this, but I like to think that it's perhaps because they're excited about our project too. They took the very unusual step of giving us the first two years in one lump, okay? And so, again, I'm not sure if this is the question you're asking, but we will we will be reporting every year. Our next shot will you know of getting the rest of the grant will be in the second year. One of the things that this kind of grant does for you because it, as I said, it's capacity building. It is in increasing our ability to do this kind of research. Is is that as we acquire the facilities and so forth that this grant lets us do, we will be better positioned to go to other funding sources and compete for additional capabilities. And so it really is kind of a, I mean, we're doing some important research. It's a pump priming exercise as well. And so folks that are, you know, like our folks are, that they're excited, they're, they're, uh, they're aggressive in terms of, of wanting to move this area forward. Uh, every opportunity that's going to come along where they see that they, there's an opportunity to secure additional funds from this source or that to help buttress what we're doing, I'm sure they're going to be availing themselves of that. So how long before we see some kind of result do you think? The first results will be in the form of improvements in our in our breeding programs, which I would hope that some of that would be happening at least in an exper- you know at least among some of the more innovative breeders and so forth i I'd be hoping that some of that would be happening uh, as we get to that two year benchmark. Uh, we've got a, a significant number of corporate cooperators that are major players in their respective areas. They tend to look at, you know, how fast are we going to turn things around? I would hope that in that same time frame we'd see some some activities there. And so that, that two-year time horizon I, I think is a key one for us. That's kind of the time frame that at least I'd be looking at. Visiting with the K-State Radio Network's Richard Baker there, that's K-State Professor of Agronomy Stephen Welch. He, along with fellow researchers Philip Alderman of Oklahoma State University and Franklin Fondjo Fotu of Langston University, have again been awarded a $4 million grant from the National Science Foundation to build this new computer model for wheat that will integrate crop physiology and genetics toward improved crop yields facilitated by new cutting-edge field monitoring technologies. Noting that industry partners cooperating in the project include IBM Research, DuPont Pioneer, Topcon Agriculture, DJI, and Veris Technologies. You are tuned in to Agriculture Today. We'll stand aside now for a few moments, and then when we return, we'll have today's top stories from the Agricultural News page for you. And, of course, this being a Tuesday, K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook is awaiting with this week's edition of Milk Lines. Also ahead, our weekly get-together to take a look at another wildlife management topic with K-State's Charlie Lee. Still to come here on the K-State Radio Network. Please stay with us. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Welcome back to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Glad to have you along on this Tuesday, September the 11th. Always remember the significance of this date and 
Take a moment today to reflect on it, if you would. Well, the USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service is delaying this week's crop progress report until later today due to technical issues, according to a statement on the agency's website. So we will have the weekly Kansas crop progress and condition report for you this time tomorrow right here. Top trade officials from the U.S. and the European Union reached no breakthrough yesterday in Brussels on laying out a pact that would deliver on their president's earlier agreement to avert a transatlantic economic fight by slashing tariffs and boosting commerce. After their first meeting since President Trump and his EU counterpart Jean-Claude Juncker declared that the intention in July, uh, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and European Trade Commissioner Cecilia Malm Armstrong said they had a constructive and forward-looking meeting, but provided no details. Those talks followed public spats between American and European officials over whether the proposed deal would cover agriculture, a contentious trade sector that has emerged as an early threat to the talks' progress. The latest push for an EU-U.S. trade deal marks the third effort since 2007 to tighten links in the world's largest bilateral trade and investment partnership with $1 trillion in annual bilateral goods and services trade, the U.S. and the EU have repeatedly tried and failed to cut already low transatlantic duties of less than 3% on average, as well as align regulations and open new markets for both sides by liberalizing sectors, including agriculture and public procurement. Now, Lighthizer and Malmstrom said they would meet again at the end of this month and start hammering out a deal in the coming months. The two trade officials will complete a framework for cutting tariffs and non-tariff trade barriers in November, according to the U.S. Trade Representative's office. According to USDA economists, farmers in Brazil and Argentina have not yet been able to take full advantage of the trade dispute between the U.S. and China. Here's more on that from the USDA's Gary Crawford. With the Chinese tariffs on U.S. soybeans and other farm products cutting sales of those U.S. products... This was a golden opportunity for the Argentinians and the Brazilians that they haven't been able to capitalize on necessarily very well. Seth Meyer is USDA's Outlook Board Chairman, first for Argentina. There had been export taxes on grains and soybeans there. The government had just about eliminated those, but now the government has just basically put those taxes back in operation. So presumably that changes the dynamic of exports a little bit. It slightly incentivizes domestic use and and it disincentivizes exports. So it's, it makes it harder for them to ca- capitalize on what's been an opportunity for them. In Brazil, it's a different problem. Continuous disruptions from their trucker strike. So they appear to have the corn, but they weren't exporting it at the pace they could have, which is really what gave us a lot of export strength in corn and provided us a good counter-seasonal demand move. And has once again kept Brazil from fully taking advantage of the U.S.-China tariff situation. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. And yesterday, a top administration official defended a plan to revamp the Endangered Species Act, saying that the proposed changes would result in more effective, quicker decisions on species protection. Deputy Interior Secretary David Bernhardt dismissed criticism by environmental groups that the plan would curtail crucial protections for threatened animals and plants, saying that uh, the administration in the Obama era often strayed from the law to focus solely on species protection without regard for costs to nearby landowners or businesses and uh, without doing much to restore species. On we go now to this week's edition of Milk Lines. Standing by, K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers with just a few ideas of how we navigate some of the financial issues we're likely to face here for the next year. As we look at how we might put our farm in a better position to deal with the narrow margins that we're probably looking at for the next few months, there's a couple things that we might want to consider. Most of you probably think about working on the expense side of the ledger, trying to reduce expenses during these times, and those are always good things to look at. Making sure that, for example, with feed that we carefully evaluate additives and other things that increase our feed costs but also may increase our milk production. We need to carefully evaluate those to make sure that we're actually getting increased milk production for those increased dollars that we're spending on feed. So careful evaluation there with your nutritionist is very, very important as feed costs still represents about 45% of our total cost. 
However, this morning, I want you to think about what we might do on the other side of the ledger sheet in terms of milk flow. As we come out of summer and as we go into uh, the early fall and head into winter, one of the things I want you to carefully evaluate is just each animal that you actually have in your herd. And one of the most important things probably to think about right now is how many days in milk is this animal and what is her repro status. So as we're coming out of summer, we probably have quite a few animals in our herd that are still open. Many of those animals may be 150 days or more in milk. So a critical question you need to ask yourself is, do I continue to breed this animal, or is it an animal that probably needs to leave our farm at some point? So as we're making these decisions, we might have the opportunity to do some synchronization and maybe in the next 30 days get this animal pregnant. However, if that's not going to happen we really do probably need to think about whether or not she needs to be culled and at what point does she need to be culled. Now, the thing that we need to think about then is the uh, heifers that we might have to bring into the herd. If you have a good supply of heifers, removing her from the herd actually isn't probably a bad idea as we have an animal to take her place. The other side of that coin that you need to think about is also your total herd size. In other words, the number of cows that you actually have lactating. Let's just think about this for a minute. Just adding five more cows to your herd, if those animals average 70 pounds of milk over the next year, will add another 16,000 in income to your farm. If they're 80-pound animals, that's another 18,000. And if they're 90-pound animals over the next year, it's another 20,000 in revenue to the farm. So think about what we can do in terms of making sure that we have animals that are very productive in our herd, taking a close look at your reproductive status of each animal in the herd and making critical decisions as to whether or not she stays in your herd, then also considering if I increase my herd size slightly, what kind of boost in income might that give to my bottom line? This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Mike. And this is Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans in more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. This Agriculture Today concludes with another look at wildlife management. And in the guest chair once more is Wildlife Specialist K-State Research and Extension Charlie Lee. Charlie, a closer examination today of livestock guardian dogs, again, as a way to ward predators away from livestock, a a method and a practice that has a long history behind it. Yes, there's a written information of more than 2,000 years, the value of livestock guardian dogs. A livestock guardian dog is a dog that's been bred specifically to protect livestock from predators. They primarily stay with the livestock. The protection that they provide is instinctive and that can be modified with proper training. The dog bonds with the herd at an early age and uh, socializes with the herd and actually thinks they're a herd member. They've been used to protect many different species of livestock, but primarily sheep, goats, cattle, and in some cases chickens. They're not a herding dog, which is used to control livestock movement. This is an animal that's sole purpose is to protect the herd from predation. And there are certain breeds that are acclimated to this behavior? There are lots of breeds. Many of them are large dogs. Some of the more common breeds that our listeners may be familiar with would be Great Pyrenees. Uh, Many of these dogs approach 100 pounds in size. So we have the Great Pyrenees, we have Commodores, Maremmas, Okbosh, Anatolian, uh, and many, many other breeds with new breeds now being more widely promoted. 
the problems with some of these dogs um, in that you would think if, if we've been using this as a protection tool, management option for 2,000 years, we would have a good body of science to uh, evaluate some of the reasons they don't work. Because as I travel around visiting with livestock producers and deal with predation problems, there's probably a, a small percentage that actually employ livestock guardian dogs. The sheep and goat industry certainly has a larger percent, but probably in the 20 to 25 percent range, it would be much smaller for the other livestock species. And when I visit with people and ask why, they cite lots of problems. And some of those limitations of guardian dogs and some possible solutions was the subject for a worldwide conference that took place in 2015, and, and those results were just published last year. Well, what would some of those problems be? Does it get back to just how guardian dogs go about protecting the herd? Well, that's one of them. Uh, people are, don't have a good understanding of how livestock guardian dogs work. Typically, they respond to an uh, encroachment from a predator by vocalizing, usually a, a loud bark. Then they leave the livestock and then they travel up to five to 600 meters away from the livestock to approach uh, whatever animal is coming into that home range. Depending on where the predator enters that home range, uh, they may act somewhat differently. The further away they are, the more frequently they just vocalize. If there's more than one livestock guardian present, some just vocalize and stay close to the sheep. Others move out to the point where the predation event occurs. So how does that translate into issues with guardian dogs? Well, the issues that this group uh, articulated started with some personal constraints and, and the reluctance and lack of familiarity with livestock guardian dogs and lack of motivation to use such a management option. Uh, there seems to be a, a resistance from livestock operators to accept responsibility to protect livestock and that that responsibility is theirs and not really residing with someone else and that it really is going to take additional education and networking and perhaps experience uh, or more familiarity with people that are employing livestock guardian dogs to overcome that particular problem. Some of the problems must have to do with the public at large and their concerns about guardian dog activity then. To me, that seems to be a, a very important and, and a primary concern, and that's some of the social constraints. There's conflicts with livestock guardian dogs in communities. It's not unusual in populated areas where you have uh, conflicts with not only the adjacent neighbors but those in the, in the community. The dogs may also try to protect the flock from people walking by, bicycling by, hunters, hunters' dogs. And all of those conflicts, since dogs don't respect property boundaries, may extend off of the property where they're supposed to be staying and, and protecting the flock because they, they travel into the dog's home range and not just the personal property range. So are there general solutions to these and other concerns revolving around the use of guardian dogs? Well, I think some of the solutions are select and train the, the dog to reduce aggressiveness, particularly to, to humans, uh, and reduce uh, the aggressiveness to other dogs. Uh, that's uh, important, and you can do some of that and minimize some of those problems by selecting the, the proper dog at the beginning, spaying and neutering, Livestock guardian dogs can reduce their need and desire to wander off site. It also does not seem to impact their ability to protect the flock from predators and does not seem to impede their, their ability to work together with other livestock guardian dogs in a small group. So I think there's certainly some, some things that can be done, but it's primarily a, a need that we need to promote how valuable they can be as we start to get more and more reluctance to use lethal means of protecting livestock from predators. There certainly lethal techniques can provide a solution, but typically they're short-term. 
and that's one of another uh, issue when using livestock guardian dogs. They don't work well in areas where poisons, traps, and snares are also employed either on that particular property or on neighbor properties. So that can be certainly be a challenge. And until we overcome some of those challenges, it's going to be difficult to expect most livestock producers to use livestock guardian animals as a sole means of protection of their herds. Once again, though, they have proven that they can be a valuable answer to predation problems in livestock housing areas. Charlie, we appreciate the information. Charlie Lee, Wildlife Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. So goes our Tuesday edition. Thanks for being along with us. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.